The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. He voted for Caltrain modernization and high-speed rail, and he's holding PG&E's feet to the fire. Assemblyman Jerry Hill is here to talk about these two hot issues and more. The game is politics and the game is on. I'm Mark Simon. Thanks for joining in on the game. We're joined today by Assemblyman Jerry Hill. He's been in the State Assembly for four years, and I think it could be argued that this might have been his toughest year. The state's fiscal crisis has only gotten worse. He's had his hands full considering or overseeing the way PG&E has responded to the terrible pipeline explosion in San Bruno two years ago. And he sided with the majority in supporting funding for high-speed rail, including $700 million for Caltrain. Jerry Hill represents San Mateo County in the Assembly, a job he won 10 years ago. Thanks for being here, Jerry. Thank you, Mark. Let me say at the top, in the interest of full disclosure, I work for Caltrain right. uh, in my, my day job. Uh, let's talk about that high-speed rail vote because it was very controversial, yeah. less so in the Assembly, uh, but certainly among your constituents, there was a sizable number of, of group people who didn't want you to vote for this, who wanted you to vote against it. Tell us, take us through your vote. Well, I'd be happy to, Mark. And as I looked at it, what we did not do last week was write and sign a check for $68 billion. That did not happen. What we did do is vote a portion of those funds that will be used throughout the state for public transit. And that's really, as I looked at it, there were three issues that were important to me. Uh, when you take what the voters voted for in 2008 and, and kind of the activism and the, the oversight that I've tried to look at on the peninsula especially, with the hearings that we've had and trying to bring in the, an understanding of what high-speed rail meant for, for the peninsula and the valley. And what I had, there were three conditions to my vote. One was that we would limit and make sure and guarantee that there would only be two tracks on the peninsula, that we would have a two-track system for high-speed rail and for Caltrain. The second issue was that there would be uh, money in, in this first phase that would electrify Caltrain. And full disclosure as well, as you know, I sat on the Caltrain board for many years and the Samtrans board, and I, in that capacity, I've seen the modeling, I've watched the studies, and I know the benefit, the tremendous benefit to public transit on the peninsula with electrification of Caltrain and the modernization of Caltrain. I mean, it's a 150-year-old system that hasn't changed. It's still, de not steam, but diesel, uh, diesel engines that are heavy. So it had to have the funding for that. And the third element or the third leg to that stool for my vote and support was that there would be independent value in the money that was spent in the valley, in the Central Valley. It had to be something that would support itself. So as I look at it, I, would, I was willing to make this $2.6 billion appropriation, which is what we're talking about here. That's all, $2.6 billion state money. And with that $2.6, we leveraged about $12 billion of federal and local funds for public transit in California. Now, you look at the independent peer review uh, board for the high-speed rail, they looked at the Central Valley funding and, and the phase that was going in there, and they said that it, uh, their, um, their claim was it substantially met their concerns for independent utility. So we're going to get the value for whatever money we spend, and that's crucial there. It's the same in Southern California. Uh, the money that's going to Southern California to improve Metrolink and the, the connections and connectivity there, as well as here. But more importantly, we're getting in the peninsula and the Bay Area 20% of the state dollars that are going to be used here, and 20% in Southern California. That's a considerable amount of money. So as I looked at those three opportunities, and, and you take electrification for one, the benefits that that will bring to this system uh, in terms of 90% less pollution, quieter trains, faster, many more stops. You can take the baby bullet that takes an hour to go from San Francisco to San Jose today. I think it makes four stops in that hour. It could make, I think, up to 10 or 12 stops in that same hour. Look at the numbers that that will attract. And the modeling is, you know, from 45,000 passengers today, it'll take over 70,000 passengers a day when this is built out as, as electrification and modernization of Caltrain. That will be tremendous for the needs that we have. I mean, drive on 101 in the morning or in the afternoon. It takes an hour to get from San Jose to, to San Mateo. 
much less the, the time that takes away from productivity of people in their jobs and in their professions, but more importantly, what that does to their home life. Let's talk a little bit about, go back a little bit, sure. start, start with the $68 billion, because the critics will say it, it may not be the $68 billion, but it's a huge down payment on something we're going to have to do. It, you, you make it sound as though we bought sort of a standalone deal. The critics will say, no, you just bought a down payment on high-speed rail. The four tracks are going to come. The disaster is in the offing, and we've just started our way toward a disaster we'll not be able to stop. Well, people can say that all they want, but the, the bottom line is we just appropriated $2.6 billion of state funds. That's it. And for me to vote for another dime for high-speed rail, it will have to meet that same criteria. The same questions that I asked in this particular phase, I'll be asking then. Whatever phase we work on, will that be independently secure in, in this sense? I mean, look at the Central Valley. It will, add, it will reduce the travel time, I think, from Bakersfield to Madera by an hour. Yeah, but the, the, the point a lot yeah. of people say about the Central Valley is no one wants to go to those well, places. No, they do. They're, they they keep calling it the train to nowhere. Now, the people in Fresno may not think that right. where they live is nowhere, but you're, you're spending a heck of a lot of money for a train track that really isn't serving major population centers. Well, there are major. I mean, when you look at Fresno and Bakersfield, uh, those are major population centers that will be growing over the next 20 and 30 years because that's really where the population has been growing and where it will grow in the future. So you will, you will have that, that opportunity and it will meet the needs there by having faster trains. More people will ride them because of the speed. And, uh, and that's, you know, we have a culture of driving in California that's been our, our, no one wants to get out of their cars. But a lot of the reasons that they don't want to get out of their cars is because we don't have a vibrant, robust public transit system. This will provide that certainly for the, the Bay Area when we're having new, uh, you know, part of the funding that we did or, or new BART cars. I mean, BART has the oldest fleet in the country of cars, and we just saw what happened in Oakland when they had that fire next to the BART station, and BART was shut down for the tunnel for that morning, the congestion and just the disaster that we were within in the Bay Area. If we start breaking, cars start breaking down uh, on a regular basis, we'll see the same thing. So we're going to have a much better system. This is not, this is not a down payment. It, it's a down payment, but it's a down payment that's sustainable and will provide the public transit that, that will uh, balance the cost that we've made. So standalone, if we don't spend another dime, we have value for that money that's well worth it. There were a lot of people who were saying, uh, take the money out of the Central Valley and spend it even more on the, on the San Francisco air, the, the Northern and Southern California bookends. What was wrong with that plan? That sounds well, like a reasonable plan. I think it is a reasonable plan. However, the federal government made it clear that they wanted that initial phase to be in the Central Valley, and they were paying the majority of the cost, of the, the funding for that. Their, their, their contribution for that phase was $3.3 .3 billion. And, uh, and that, uh, for the $2.6 billion that we're contributing, uh, is a pretty good deal. Uh, and, uh, and you take that plus of the 2.6, 20% of it's coming here, 20% of it's going to Southern California. It's a darn good investment, and uh, you, you, you can't beat that, as, uh, as I saw it. Was this a hard vote? Was this an easy vote? I mean, a lot of people are throwing around the word courageous for people who voted no. Right. Uh, was voting yes easy vote? No, of course not. It, it's been a difficult challenge. I've, been, I've spent the last couple of months working to make sure that the proposal, the assembly proposal, which is the one that we voted on, that that budget uh, trailer language guaranteed that this will be a two-track system, blended system on the peninsula, and guaranteed that the funding would be there. Those were the two issues, the two parts of that stool that I was basing it on, that those were included in there. If they were not in that budget language, and we looked at it every minute, watching it as it moved through the process, if, it, if those were not there, I would not have voted for this. And I said that before, that it would have been a tough vote, and, uh, and it wouldn't have been there. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. Sure. Thanks for being with us. You stick around. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage.
Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon, joined by Assemblyman Jerry Hill. We're talking about what else? Yeah. High-speed rail and Caltrain modernization. Of course. Um, it, it sounds as though if, if the Caltrain part wasn't in it, you would have voted against this. Absolutely. What was it about, um, and, and the concerns were that this was the camel's nose under the tent. So what was it about modernizing Caltrain that was so critical? And what was it about the way this was done that made it acceptable to you? Well, the, the, the modernization of Caltrain is so significant to the future of public transit on the peninsula and in the valley uh, that uh, if we want to take this into the 21st century in terms of having a robust, active transit system and looking at the economy that is focused now more so along the, the innovative economy, along the corridor, when you're having downtowns of San Mateo and Redwood City, Belmont, all of the smaller cities uh, or the cities along the, the corridor, the downtowns are vibrant and people are living in San Francisco and San Jose and, and they want to get there, they don't want to get in their cars. So I mean this is something for the future. And the important part of that for me is that I, I knew what this would bring when you increase ridership from almost double ridership, increase, open some of the stations that we closed, you know, the opportunities of Broadway and, and Burlingame or back to Atherton, the possibility of opening stations again that have been provided and could provide greater uh, availability. So I saw that as, as crucial. And, and really for me, that was the, the tipping point. If we could provide that opportunity and those benefits here, and I saw the independent utility in the valley and Southern California getting their share of, of these funds, which is unusual for them to get an equal share as the, as the Bay Area in the terms of 20 percent of the, the, the money. That's unusual. Southern California never comes out equal with the, you know, they're, they're, you know, with the number of the population. They usually get obviously a lot more. We were talking before the break about um, the political spin on this, on this vote. Uh, is, it a, is it a risky vote for you? You're running for another office. Uh, is this something that's going to drag down your campaign? Is this a negative among the voters? And if it is, why didn't you do what the voters wanted you to do? Well, I, you know, my sense is, and you could talk to 10 voters and five of them would say they support high-speed rail or they support modernization of Caltrain, and another four or five would say they didn't support it. Uh, I, I don't think it was conclusive from what I could see and from what I've heard of the constituents that we communicate with. And uh, so that left the decision to me. And, and for me, frankly, I'm interested in good public policy. I mean, that's, the, that's what you're elected to do. You make a decision and you have to use your best judgment. And to me, with looking at the facts, looking at the benefit for the Bay Area, the benefit for the peninsula and the valley, looking at the, the, the benefits that will be derived in the Central Valley and the benefits in, in Los Angeles, and being able to leverage that $2.7 billion into $12 billion of federal and local funds, I mean, this is exactly the, the, the stimulus that we need for public transit in California. Yeah. There's a group called High Speed Rail Boondoggle took out a big ad, mm -hmm. uh, very critical of those who voted for this. Um, I saw a flyer the other day that came out uh, that they're circulating by email. It says essentially the same thing. Uh, X number of legislators in this area voted yes and one courageously voted no, a reference to State Senator Joe Simidian. Uh, are you worried there will be political fallout? Well, I, I, there, there may be some, some fallout. I think if I can make the case, if I have an opportunity to explain my vote, explain the benefits that came from this, and the fact that we didn't spend, didn't write nor sign the check for $68 billion, uh, and that this, in my view, it could stop at the next appropriation, and we'd still have good use and value for the money we spent. Yeah. Let's shift gears to something else you spend a lot of time. Sure. It's three letters as well, PG&E. I guess the, the ampersand doesn't count as a letter. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's been uh, about two years since the explosion, yeah. terrible, terrible explosion. Homes are being rebuilt. The community is starting to piece itself back together again. Uh, but I guess it really raised a red flag for a lot of people about the aftermath of this. How, how weakened is our pipeline system? How well is it being monitored? Do we even know where all of them are and what kind of shape they're in? What, what have you learned about PG&E's diligence in this area? Well, I, I guess what I've learned in the last two years is that and it didn't take long to learn that because we could see right in the aftermath of the, the problems and trying to identify where the, their gas lines were, the condition of those pipes, when they had been properly tested before, what they have done with the money that they were 
were appropriated and, and allowed in, in ratepayer money that they were supposed to be using for repairs and testing and modernization that they diverted to profits and bonuses uh, along the way. So what we saw was kind of a house that was crumbling. And it, uh, it, it was crumbling because it couldn't stand on any basis of safety and basis of, of good, good management. And, and that's really the problem because they, they have not done a good job in the past. I think there's new leadership, uh, but frankly, I'm still very skeptical because they will look at every opportunity to, to cut a corner or to avoid, I mean, the legislation, they're fighting hard to kill legislation I have in Sacramento um, that uh, would make this a safer system or hold them more accountable or put their profits in terms of how safe their system is. So they, uh, they're still politically and uh, with their influence in Sacramento doing a big job of trying to cut us off. Now their argument would be, yeah, we're looking for ways to cut costs because it's not our money. It's the, it's the ratepayers' money. We're trying to get the most out of the ratepayer dollar. You're saying that's not the case? Or you, I, don't know, I don't know what's wrong no. with that line of reasoning. Well, it, it, it's not, not true. In, in what they've done in the past is they had cut corners. You know, PG&E, in their system, they make a billion dollars a year in profit. Only 100 million of that actually comes from gas. Most of their profit is electricity. So this was kind of the poor stepchild of their system. Mm -hmm. And they neglected it. They neglected it and used every opportunity to cut corners. One of the issues is that they're guaranteed a certain profit. That profit is guaranteed to them. The only way they can exceed that is they have to divert money that would go to legitimate expenses, take that money and put it someplace else and not spend it, and then that increases their profit. And that's really a disincentive for safety. And that's one of the issues that they've had. But they, you know, we've been fighting and monitoring. We don't have necessarily a safer system today. And that's really the, the challenge because every week or two we hear of other problems that, that uh, come to light from the system that's underground, the system we can't see, the system that they had supposedly been testing over the years. But they here again, they selected a testing method that was the least comprehensive, the least thorough, and the least responsible and to the determine the condition, and the least expensive. We're going to take another break. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back with Assemblyman Jerry Hill. Need some video work done? We can do that. We do all that video stuff. We can even put your video on that internet thingy. At Peninsula TV, we do full-blown in-studio production. Talk shows, performances, speeches, anything. Remote multi-camera production, on location, at your event. And for the budget-minded, single camcorder production in high definition. We'll take your video project from first idea to finished product. For more info, contact Peninsula TV. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon, joined by Assemblyman Jerry Hill. We're talking about PG&E. I want to go back and, and, and revisit something you just said because yeah. it's alarming. You don't think the system's any safer now than it was during the explosion? When the explosion I think there's some, there's some areas, uh, Mark, that, that, are, that are not safe because they, they really don't know. They're pressure testing some lines, but a lot of them that, they've, that they have and don't have records for, and that's really where a lot of the problem is. They don't have adequate... Uh, thorough record keeping that identifies what type of pipe it is, when it was properly tested last, and, and how, it, how substantial it is today. They, they know where everything is, don't they? Well, they know where it is. I, yes, they know where it is That's now. But, but I think there was a time when they didn't know where it, where it is. So they have to, if they can't identify the pipe, they have to, and can't show that it had been properly tested, they have to go in and either replace the pipe or test it again. And in a lot of cases, those are instances where they're not clear what the, that condition is, and they're still running the, the gas at a high pressure through those lines. Let's shift gears a little bit, talk sure. about the state budget, and in particular the ballot measure in November that the governor put on basically to raise taxes yeah. to pay for balancing the state budget. And the state budget you submitted was balanced, but it was balanced sort of on the come. Yes. It was balanced on the assumption that this was going to pass. First of all, isn't, isn't that the wrong way to balance a budget based on revenues you hope might come. I mean, it's one thing to, to do it based on tax revenues you know will right. come in. 
But this is really kind of a roll of the dice, isn't it? Well, it, it is, but the budget, I mean, we're, we're clear and honest about it, and the governor was as well, that if you know, those trigger cuts will go into effect when we don't have the, the revenue that, uh, that's coming. So the budget is, is clearly identified and will be balanced all along, because if those revenues do not materialize, then the cuts will go into effect. I mean, I've been there for, for, for almost four years now, and we have cut over $50 billion from our budget. Why isn't, why isn't it balanced? I don't understand. Well, why can't you cut your way out of this mess? Well, you can, and we have, but yeah. you, you, you can't cut everything. If you continue to cut, I mean, that's the, the argument we keep hearing. Just keep cut, cut, cut. We have cut tremendously. If, if you look at the services that we're providing and uh, the things that people rely on, look at the court system has been reduced, the CSU system, the UC system, K through 12 education has been cut tremendously. The plan in the future, if the tax measure passes, and looking, because we have projected out for the next three or four years based on the, uh, um, the strategic and the structural deficit that we had, we will be doing great in the next four years, re regardless of how the income comes in in terms of the, the economy turning around. And in that sense, we will be giving education back about 12 to $15 billion will come into play. So in the f going out, it looks great. We just have to get through this, this really tough time. Well, is it a tough time, or is it that the state's finances are just not well organized and well funded? Well, it's you know the uh, Standard and Poor's just did a nice analysis in their uh, uh, in one of their uh, their briefing papers that talks about how California the problem isn't a spending problem. The problem is a a revenue and a taxation problem because most of the income that comes into California government is based on personal and corporate income taxes, and those are so cyclical. When the economy's up, they will climb fast, and when down, it, it, it's, it's a, a steep and a fast, rapid decline. So there's no stability there that allows for us to plan and to move forward. And, and frankly, the legislature in the past has not had a reserve. They've not planned for that rainy day or that problem. And county government, when I was there, I mean, we, that's a priority for me. We have had over $200 million budget surplus that you could use when you had a, a downtime. In Sacramento, and a lot of it was based on term limits, People spent every dime that came in for every good program, and they were all good. But you, you have to be able to realize that you need to put something away for that rainy day. How much of that is, if you're basing your, your budget on uh, corporate taxes and personal income taxes, I, I would imagine a more stable source of, of revenue would be property taxes, but that's not going to be the source of revenue it used to be because of Proposition 13. Right, it won't be property taxes, but it could be sales tax. In, uh, um, you know, they, they talk about putting sales taxes on, on the services. But you could add, you could broaden. Well, aren't, aren't those cyclical as well? Well, not as much, no. Yeah. They, they don't decline as, as rapidly and as much as, as corporate and, and uh, personal income taxes. Especially, you know, Silicon Valley provides a lot of the revenue to state government, especially on the, with the, you know, the Facebook IPO that came out a, few mo a month or so ago. That, uh, I mean, I've heard anywhere from a half a billion to a billion dollars in revenue that will come into the state uh, based on that. Well, I mean, that's a lot more, and, and then when the dot-com bust hit in 2000, things dropped rapidly, mm -hmm. and we didn't see that. And that's really the problem. It goes up and down, and you need something stable. Sales tax is fairly stable, and when it drops, it doesn't drop in the 50% basis, as, as we see in, in corporate income taxes. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, we talked a little bit about balancing the budget, people's expectations. Uh, if you look at polling data, I don't think there are very many institutions in the state that score lower than the legislature. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's deserved? Well, I, I think it's it's deserved in, to some extent uh, because you, you look at some of the actions of some legislators and you look at the actions in, in total. This is a big state. You know, with 38 million people, uh, there's a lot of diversity. There are a lot of different interests. I mean, we're... we're you have people, you know, the Riverside the, in Southern California, the Orange County, the, there are different political uh, influences that, uh, that, that play onto this. So you don't have, not everyone's going to agree. And uh, the direction of the state's not going to be where everyone wants it to go. But I'm not sure we expect you all to agree so much as we expect you all to work together. Is, is sometimes, is that just not possible? It's sometimes not possible. And, and it's the hardest thing. When I got to the legislature in 2008, um, we, we did. We worked uh, closely together, and then for some reason in 2010, there was a, a shift, and it's similar to what we saw in Washington. There was a group from both sides, not just the Republicans, but the Democratic side as well, a shift of uh, a lot more polarization and, and almost an anger 
that we see uh, related to, to, to common ground and to try and find that collaborative spirit that, that I think is important and that I've tried to bring to the legislature and been worked hard on, even here locally. You're the caucus chair. I chair the, and my one of my closest friends is the chair of the Republican caucus. Um, so isn't it your responsibility to make these things, to explain to your caucus why it's important to get along, not just go along? Well, of course, and that's part of the, the job is to make sure that everyone understands that. But the difficulty with that is when they're on the floor and dealing with some of the conversations and some of the, uh, the discussions that come from that, uh, they get a personal, uh, it's more of a personal anxiety that, I, that I've watched and seen. And then they react to that. And they react at it because they're representing a district someplace in the state that, that really rep that they represent the, the thoughts of that district. And, and that comes out more than a caucus position. I think people never thought that our diversity would be a weakness. Uh, we thought it would be a strength. Well, if, it, if we're talking about ethnic diversity and cultural diversity, it is. It's the political diversity that's the real problem. Yeah. Jerry Hill, thanks so much for being with us. We look Thank forward you. to seeing you again soon. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for joining us and join us next time on The Game.